things, and I want to move to the Obamacare rather. I mean, everything we're talking about with Medicare now is really a revision to Medicare, not a revision to Obamacare. Uh, it one of the downsides is you're not going to reduce overall national health expenditures by raising the Medicare age. What you're really doing is you're shifting those costs. And in fact, since Medicare pays lower prices than other payers, except for Medicaid, you may actually increase it, it uh, overall health care spending, even though it's not showing up on the federal dime. And there's a there'll be a very significant set of challenges if you really executed this. How do we actually you know, what does that mean, and, and what does it mean to, say, the retirement plans of various employers and to individual savings if you have a bunch of middle-class people and above who are, uh, you know, who will not be in the Medicare system and therefore will be paying higher unit prices for their health care as they get into their older years? Uh, yeah, so, so there's, there's, a, there's just, uh, I wish I had a pen and a paper because there's, there's a lot I would dispute in what you just said. I think what a lot of what you said is, is taken as an article of faith on the left, but I would contest it all pretty vigorously. So first of all, um, the point about uh, the Medicare paying less than private insurers, it's true that Medicare pay pays less than traditional employment-based commercial insurance, but when it comes to competition on an exchange where there's enormous competitive pressure to keep premiums low and therefore reimbursement rates low, I think we're likely to see that over time reimbursement rates in the exchange-based market are quite similar, if not lower, uh, than Medicare. And, and certainly we, we have a lot of reason to believe they'd be more cost-efficient. So, for example, in Medicare Advantage, we know that if you take an apples-to-apples -apples comparison of benefits, David Cutler and a couple of colleagues at Harvard did this study, they found that an apples-to-apples -apples, uh, comparison of, of insurance plans between traditional public option, government-run Medicare, and comparable benefits in Medicare Advantage Part C, but the Medicare Advantage plans were 9% less expensive or less costly. So I think there's a lot, uh, actually, that private insurers can bring to the table that I think, I think there's been a lot of kind of intellectual complacency on the left in terms of, there's this dogma that, well, Medicare is obviously the, the least expensive approach. Now, I, I, I would agree with you that if Medicare came uh, with it more aggressive price controls and things like that, then you could see a more aggressive uh, reduction in spending uh, relative to the kind of uncontrolled private market, uh, but that isn't what Medicare is today, right? So Medicare has limited uh, ability to affect, but it has some, but not nearly as much as I think the left would want. And, and so I, I think... By the way, I, I think, think both the left and right will move increasingly to price controls in Medicare one way or another as we start to face the fiscal pressures of it. I think I think you may be right, and, and you know, uh, and I, I certainly, you know, as a conservative free market guy, I don't like price controls. But I, I, the way I tackle it in the plan is, I say, look, if you're going to have hospital monopolies that have effectively infinite pricing power within their regions, you've got to be able to do something to combat that because the monopoly is already there. It's hard to break up an existing hospital monopoly. One thing you can do is leverage Medicare's pricing power in that particular region. And I think, you know, when I've talked to center-left health economists, that's something that people on the center-left, I think, are fairly receptive to and, and maybe more controversial on the right. But I think that's a way of, of tackling the problem in a more precise way than, than, say, progressives might want, which is to say, my view is the best way to reduce prices is to have more provider competition. We don't have enough provider competition in this country. If there are areas of the country where there just isn't any provider competition, for example, heavily rural areas, for example, or heavily consolidated areas, where it's not realistic to expect a lot of provider competition, then you may have to have uh, some sort of regulated approach to address that. So I, I, I you know, I've, I've tried in that part of the plan to really uh, to bring forward some some uh, ideas that that may form a basis for some kind of again centrist approach to all this that will that will that will look out for the taxpayers because again, as much as you know, uh, the libertarians who who I who I like and know. Are, are going to be are, are going to be you know their hair is going to be standing on end when I talk about things like that. Um, the way I look at it is is if you have a true market failure, and I consider a true a, a provider monopoly to be a true market failure, you have a lot of tools you can use to to improve that situation, like improve, increasing the amount of competition. But I think one of the tools in the toolbox has to be if this is a true monopoly, it needs to be regulated to some degree in the fashion that uh, monopolistic utilities. are. By the way, one of the challenges we also have is that if it's insurers versus providers, insurers just have no public credibility in many of these encounters. 
and you know. yeah, you know, and that's a and that's a real shame because um, I, I, I think private insurers have been they have had some practices that that are appropriate to, to be criticized, but to a large degree they get demonized for being the ones who are saying no, right? So in any healthcare system, if you look at Europe. It's the government that gets attacked for that, right? So, if, if, you know, if, if there's if there's a, a you know a, a very expensive medicine or an expensive treatment that the uh, the government says no to because it's too expensive, they're the ones that get attacked, right? So, uh, you're going to get attacked being the gatekeeper and the payer, no matter what kind of system you have. And I think what one of the great failings of the left in all this, to the degree that the left cares about affordable health coverage for people, is that they have given a free pass to hospitals that charge whatever they want to charge. And you talk about CEOs making a lot of money. You know, there are only five big publicly traded health, you know, for-profit health insurers in America. But the hospital executives all over America, the top ten executives, all make millions upon millions of dollars. And nobody seems to care about that because they're supposedly non-profit entities. And that, that's really an accounting gimmick rather than a real economic analysis of their motives and interests. I think one of the visions of ACA is by regulating the insurance side, by regulating medical loss ratio, by, by having guaranteed issues so that they can't discriminate against the sick, that we create a more legitimate health system, health insurance system that's properly regulated that will have greater credibility to say no sometimes, especially if there's comparative effectiveness research available to look at some of the some of the practices of providers and to say, hey, you know, orthopedic surgeons, you're doing way too many surgeries, and I'm going to say no to some of these back surgeries that don't seem to be evidence based. And in a, and it seems to me if you if, if you believe in market oriented solutions to healthcare, you have to you also have to embrace something like a regulated exchange because in the absence of it the sort of race to the bottom among insurers and the individual and small group market that's, that rewards unethical practices or practices that may not be unethical but that American society increasingly rejects. We really, I think we've rejected as, as a society the idea that I'm going to turn you away or charge you a higher premium because you have cancer. I think that is, that debate is over. Uh, that in one way or another, we want a system that protects people who have pre-existing conditions. But if we create a system that deals with all these problems, then it becomes much more credible for to start to saying to the providers, hey, wait a minute, the insurers within this well-regulated system don't think this is a good uh, investment that creates patient value. Yeah, so I mean, you know, this is a bit of a digression, but I'm not sure I agree with you that society has accepted that we should... Uh, you know, be we not. You know, we should we should have a society where health status doesn't matter for insurance prices. I mean, I, I actually in my plan, I I do prohibit health status based underwriting, so I keep that feature of the ACA. But you know, you brought up the person who has cancer and, and making sure that person uh, has the same uh, health insurance premiums as a perfectly healthy person. You know, that's that's stacking the deck in terms of the question. Well, how about if I ask you this question? What about the guy who eats Doritos all day and sits on his couch? And smokes, chain smokes two packs a day. Should I, as a, as a non-smoker who exercises, pay the same health premiums as that person? Now, of course, the ACA does have a, a feature for tobacco use yeah, specifically. I'm not, I, I don't, I'm not overjoyed by that provision, by the way. Yeah, but, but I mean, so, so, so I, think, I, think, I think Americans, you know, do want to help out the person with mm -hmm. cancer. They do want to help out the kid who's born with Down syndrome. But they don't necessarily want to reward the person who's enga engaged in behavior that we all understand to be irresponsible to one's health. So I think the ethical questions involved and the moral questions involved are a little bit more complicated than you've described. But having said that, uh, I do agree with your basic premise, which is that a regulated exchange is an attractive way to deliver health insurance to those who can't afford it, either because of their income or their health status. And I, and I do think that that is a model that, uh, that, that we, we ought to build on uh, under the right circumstance. And I think, again... Uh, this is the attraction of you know, this is where Switzerland can point the way, you know, uh, broadly speaking. You know, and, and as you know, I I don't agree with everything that Switzerland does, but the general framework of having a regulated exchange where uh, we subsidize on a sliding scale, on a graduated scale, the premiums, the cost of those plans, I think is it is an attractive one that will that can and could achieve the objectives of both the left and the right. The objective of the left to make sure that that everyone has the security of health insurance and the objective of the right that uh, that, that that program is fiscally sustainable over the long term. Now, let's, let's, this is Harold Pollack talking to Ovid Roy at healthinsurance.org.
Let me ask you a few questions about Medicaid and the Obamacare specific uh, aspects. You do, you would pare back the generosity of health insurance uh, compared to the current ACA. Your your bronze, silver, gold, platinum plans are less. They cover a lower actuarial value of care than uh, than the current ACA envisions. Your instead of going up to four hundred percent of poverty, as I understand it, your subsidies would go up to three hundred and seventeen percent of the poverty line. So that you're clearly constricting. Uh, uh, in some ways, uh, and it seems to me a lot of the discussion of deregulating these plants is not exactly clear to me in all the detail what you would do to the essential health benefits. But yeah, so let me, let me address that, that because it's, it's yeah. an important topic, and, mm -hmm. and I think there's been some uh, confusion, particularly among my progressive friends, as to how this is structured. So the important thing to understand: there are a couple of important things to understand. The under Obamacare, the way it works is you have these metal tiers on the exchange. And the subsidy is geared to the second cheapest silver plan in a particular area. Uh, and so uh, if you're low income, you know, you're basically incentivized. If you qualify for Obamacare subsidies, you qual you're incentivized to buy the silver plan because that's basically f mostly fully paid for or largely paid for under the subsidy setup under Obamacare. This plan is different. So in this plan, the metal tiers are completely separate from the subsidy structure. So the metal tiers are there for consumer friendliness, so that if you're, leave, leave the subsidies aside, if you're just mm -hmm. someone who needs to buy health coverage for himself, mm -hmm. and you want to be able to say, okay, here are a bunch of plans, they, the, the details on these plans might differ, but I can compare them all because the effective financial value of these plans are the same. So an actuarial value, say, of, of let's call it 70% 70, you know, 70 or something like that. So the plans may actually peel that onion in completely different ways. Some may have certain benefits they emphasize over others, have certain cost-sharing features versus others, but you know that in general, the actuarial value of the plan is the same. That allows c consumers to decide what things they actually want health insurers to provide in a plan with a 70% actuar actuarial value benefit within certain brackets in terms of benefit requirements and guaranteed issue and community rating and the rest. So the, the, the tiers under, under my plan are meant for that purpose, for, for user friendliness. The subsidies, in terms of what kind of plan would you be subsidized for if you're eligible, eligible for subsidies, mm -hmm. the actual, actuarial value or the financial generosity of that subsidy and that benefit is quite comparable to the ACA. So the way it's uh, calculated in the plan is you start out with a, for the average person of average age and average health status, $7,000 deductible and $1,800 HSA subsidy. So remember, it's average age and average health status. So if you're older and or sicker, the deductible would be lower and the HSA subsidy would be larger. So, the, you know, so, that, so that's one element of how this plan would work. The other thing to understand is that, so, so that HSA subsidy, you, you, there's two ways to think about it. One way would be to say, well, just add the uh, HSA subsidy to the deductible, so it's a $5,200 deductible. That's one way to think about it. But the other way to remember is, the, the key thing is, if, it's a, if it were a $5,200 deductible, you'd be liable for the first $5,200. That's not how the HSA works. The HSA covers the first $1,800 of your expenses. Then you would have the deductible, or then you'd have the kind of what, what they call in Medicare uh, Part D, you know, the gap or the donut hole, and then you'd have the deductible kick in. But the key is this, that if you stay healthy over time, that HSA rolls over. And so the overall, the cumulative actuarial value of the HSA component can be quite significant if you're able to stay healthy and, and be mindful uh, of all the things that one does to try to stay healthy. So what and again, and the, another thing to keep in mind is that for low-income people, that HSA subsidy would be substantially larger because the plan takes the cost-sharing subsidies in the ACA and converts those into additional HSA subsidies. So the idea here is actually to take a benefit of, of comparable actuarial value, comparable financial benefit, but turn it into a real nest egg. So if you're low income today and you're on uh, subsidized health care under my plan, over time, hopefully, you can build a real nest egg that can allow you to save, you can pass it down to your kids, you can actually build wealth instead of handing over all of your money to insurance companies, which is what the ACA does and which is why the uh, insurance companies really love the ACA. By the way, I should say that the day that during the Supreme Court argument, 
uh, when it looked like the ACA might be overturned, uh, Aetna stock jumped by several percent in the moment of, uh, of awkward arguments. So we can debate what the insurance companies Insurance companies have a complicated view of what they like and don't like on the ACA, but it does. Well, seem to look, me look at the fi- look at the five year chart of Aetna and tell me that uh, investors haven't been happy uh, with Aetna's performance under Obamacare. I think the stock has tripled in that time frame. Well, Mazel Tov to them. There, uh, it does seem to me that. Sorry, my phone is buzz- buzzing. Uh, there, uh, I can't hear it. Uh, the um, but in terms of sub- healthy people subsidizing the sick, of course, what you just described many people will find problematic. If you have type 2 diabetes and you have significant health expenses year after year, uh, you know, uh, or you have a mental health problem, whatever it is, this structure is much more problematic. I mean, within ACA, you can actually... It's, it's only problematic if you don't adjust the core benefit for health status and age. Because the core benefit is adjusted for health status and age, that problem is addressed. So, that's the key thing to understand is that that $7,800, the $7,000 deductible and 1800 HSA is for the person of average health and average age. So if you're somebody who has a high degree of health consumption as the system gets underway, the, the, the subsidies and the deductibles would be adjusted to account for that. So the idea here is to be very careful and very thoughtful so that those, uh, those individuals are accounted for. The idea here is not to screw over the sick and the elderly, quite the opposite. By the way, this is why when this actually – if this became legislation th- – there's one thing I totally disagree with in your, in your thing, which is where you where – you, or at least where you say many people criticize the ACA for its length and complexity. What you're – the paragraph that you just spoke illustrated why any sensible health reform is going to be pretty lengthy and complex either in the law or in the – midrash that's sitting on a shelf at the IRS and at HHS trying to operationalize what this means. And I say that, right? I say and the, the, the sentence you didn't quote that's right after that sentence is that my plan will also be complex. Uh, and so I don't think it will be as complex as the ACA in the sense that, for example, the Medicare reform is fairly simple. I think that the most complicated thing in my plan is not the exchange reforms we've just described. It's the Medicaid piece. And not, not for the reasons that we're talking about, for the reason that Medicaid is different in every state. Mm-hmm. Uh, so because it's uh, jointly funded by the states and states have some uh, modest autonomy in the way they run their programs, every state is different and every state's population is different. So transitioning from the current gamish of Medicaid into a more rational system, that is the, the, the real kind of legislative uh, heavy lifting uh, in terms of how to how to do that well. By the way, and, there's uh, also the political economy of our three trillion dollar health system, which, as you right. point out, I mean, any you and I probably agree on more things than you and I would agree with a typical committee chair who happens to have a wheelchair factory in his district about a bunch of the things we've just been talking about. 